And I thought, surely somebody would have chosen this one. And uh, you know, then I saw that Seth and I were going to be on at the same time. And I thought, I didn't check the whole roster there. And I thought, are they putting all the old ones in the beginning or something, you know? And I got to thinking, you know, when it comes to uh, working, I just retired. Uh, when it comes to playing sports, I never was very good at that, but you know, I feel old in all of these things. But when it comes to preaching the Word of God, I thought, you know, I feel as young as these young people, you know. I, I, I get excited about the things of God. And, and I suppose the one way I could stay young is just preach all the time. I'd, I'd really feel great. I want to share with you uh, this great truth concerning the Spirit of God revealing to us shedding abroad in our hearts the love of God. I, those of you that know me know that I'm notorious for getting on everybody else's sermon. I generally, what I do, like it's, we used to have spiritual festivals, and we'd preach anywhere between five and ten sermons, and, and I, I would go down and, and I'd look at everybody's sermon. In fact, last year at the um, uh, Refreshing Waters uh, I got everybody. You know, I had everybody's sermons preached. I went, okay, Gibbons going to probably say this, and Seth's going to say this. Well, I don't know this person, but if I was preaching it, I would say it this. Way. So I had all the sermons in my head. Well, then when you get up to preach, you try to preach them all, you know. So I'm, I'm going to be real uh, careful to stay right with what uh, uh, I feel is is my topic. But having said that, I want to uh, give a little introduction that might touch on some of the other messages. You know, when we think of this truth concerning the love of God, it is so unique because the thoughts of God, if you go out, you talk about the various uh, uh, cultures, you, you don't hear about a God of love. Just think back, if any, any of the cultures that you can think of, and it always has to do with some ways to appease an angry God. You don't hear about a God of love. And even in our day, when, when some, this concept of the God of love is like, well, God just loves everybody, you know, where did that come from? Actually, it came not by their own thinking, it came about because of a revelation. Now, they're wrong, that the, what they said, but the thought came to them from the word of God. Now, there are some things that are plainly seen. There are some, some eternal things that, that, that everyone sees, whether they admit it or not. In the book of Romans, the uh, first chapter, the 20th verse, it says that the invisible things of God are clearly seen by the things that he made. And it tells us what those things are. It's his eternal power and his Godhead. That's why man is incurably religious, because there is a voice that is calling, being called out in nature, in the things that God created, that says to mankind, there is a God that is above you, there is a God, a sovereign God, of some idea of it, and that he's powerful. And so we spend our time trying to please this God. The, we, that can be seen. You say, well, are the they, are they heathen guilty? Yes, they're guilty. They reject this knowledge that, that God, it's, it says from, from the, like the sun going across the, uh, the earth, across the sky, over the earth. He says that's, his, his voice goes out. There's no place where his voice isn't heard. So there, there, are, some thing, there are some things that are clearly seen. But as... Uh, Moses said in Deuteronomy, there are some secret things. And the secret things belong to God. Now, I know the rest of the verse says, but, I love this disjunctive, but the things that are revealed belong to us, that we might obey him. But the truth is, there are some secret things. Seth, I, I completely agree with you that our knowledge of God, those of us that have been in the Lord a long time, uh, those that have spent their whole life studying the Word. Just, we've just touched the hem of the garment. Our understanding of God is so limited. There is a spiritual reality. There are the ways of God. The prophet said, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so is God's thoughts above ours. Or actually God said, my thoughts above yours and my ways above your ways. No, no, no wonder we can't figure out God. He's simply too big for us to figure out on our own. 
or as the apostle, somebody quoted this morning, uh, this afternoon in uh, 1 Corinthians, where he said that eye is not seen and ear hasn't heard and neither is entered into the hearts of men the thing that God, things that God has prepared for them that love him. But, another disjunctive there, but they are revealed to us. We, don't, we can't see them by ourselves. We need the Spirit of God uh, to illuminate us. In fact, the one area, and I just want to just touch on this in the way of introduction, is that the Holy Spirit is the revealer. He is called the Spirit of Truth. I love that word. I struggled with it. I told some of the brethren the other night, I, I struggled with that word. What is true? I don't know, given if you remember this, but I remember preaching out at uh, 26 in Colfax. I preached this wonderful sermon on truth. I quoted just about every verse in the scripture on truth, you know? And I, I was just finishing up, and I thought, boy, this was really good until a thought crossed my mind. You know what that thought was? But what is truth? And I quoted all the verses, but I didn't, didn't quite get into my head. And I remember I, that really bothered me. And for a long time, I thought, what, you know, what, what's another word for truth? And, and I finally, I think I have one that satisfies me, and it's, it fits just about every place. And it's simply the word reality, the way things really are. There, there is, you understand, there is this reality. Your faith in it doesn't change it one iota. Or your unbelief in it doesn't change it one iota. I asked my wife, uh, I said, if you went out and tried to start our car, and it turned over, but it, but it wouldn't start, what would be the first thing you'd look at? And I expected her to say, the gas gauge, you know, because most of us that drive cars, we really don't know too much about cars, do we? I mean, yeah, we know we have to stop every once in a while and get gas. Well, that's probably about the most thing we know. And then there is some oil something, whatever that, whenever you do that, you know. And, uh, but, well, she said, I'll, I'll, I'll wait and see what this says in the information thing. There's a little, we had that little thing that says information. She's going to. And so I said, well, what, what happens if you don't, uh, if, you know, it doesn't say anything and it still doesn't start? She says, I'll call you. <laughs> And you know, it, it's, it's somewhat that way with God. We really, we know a few things about him that doesn't keep us from enjoying them, you know. And there are those, that, you know, in our, especially in the Western cultures, we want everything so nice and straight. We like it all in order. We like to have it all figured out. We love it, as one of the actors said, we love it when the plan comes together. We like to see everything so nice and neat, you know. The only problem is we're too little to see it. God's too big for us. And so the spirit of truth becomes the revealer of this. Let me just look at a couple of verses. These are familiar ones to you, but uh, let's read them together. I loved what Danny said the other, uh, other night about reading the scriptures together. That way you hear it twice. You'll hear it when I read it, and then you'll hear it in your own eyes and in your own head. So you actually get it twice. Turn over to John, the 15th chapter. Just touching on these verses, still as a way of introduction here. John 15, verses 26 and 27, he says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which, uh, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall do what? Testify of me as well, he says, and ye shall uh, bear witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. But the Spirit of God is going to do what? He's going to testify about Jesus. He's going to open up. Now I realize that there are those, well, that was the apostles. You know, you're absolutely right, it was the apostles. But it's also us. It, it hasn't changed. The Spirit of God, one of his primary ministries, as some of the brothers are going to point out, is to, to enter into the world and primarily to reveal to testify of Jesus. A couple of verses uh, similar to that over in, in the next chapter, chapter 16, verses 13 through 15. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Use the word reality there. He's going to guide you into reality. He's going to let you see things like they really are. This is why, as uh, uh, Aaron quoted this, uh, this afternoon, this is why these light afflictions, which are but for a moment, they don't seem light, do they? They don't seem light, and, and the moment might be all of your life. 
But when you see it from God's perspective, like they really are, compared to eternity, compared to what God has for us, these light afflictions are but for a moment, and they lay out for us an eternal weight of glory. So we have to understand that there is a reality, and, and, and the spirit of truth uh, is revealing this to us. Let me continue on here. Uh, he'll lead us into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, I love this, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify, this is Jesus speaking, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, no, no, I didn't say give it unto you. Show it unto you. Open your eyes, give you understanding of this. Let's keep on reading, because this really, if that's exciting, listen to this next verse. He says, all things that the Father hath, get that, all things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I that he shall take of mine and show it unto you. What is, he got, what, what is the potential there for us? The mind of God. The mind of Christ that, that Seth's article there is about. That, that's, that's what God has for us. The only limitation is, is in us. And this is why we can spend our whole lifetime. This is what he meant when he said, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They're going to mount up with wings like eagles or run and not be weary and walk and not faint. Why? Because they're simply seeing more and more of eternity of eternal life, of God. As, as you point out, the thought that the, that the fullness of God should dwell in us. What did it say? Jesus said, all of that is the Father is mine, and the Spirit is going to show it to us. Oh, praise God. Now, do you understand? That's where we're at. Uh, let me tell you a little story. Well, chapter 14, verse 17, just says he, he, he's in you. In case you don't, he's just not floating around. God has... He that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. He is in us. He joins to our spirit. A number of years ago, I don't think this brother would say this now, but it was a long time ago. And he was preaching at a church not too far from here. And we were having a little, uh, I think we rode back from uh, Lincoln together, if I remember right. And uh, we had a little study. And when we got off on the Holy Spirit. Let me digress just a little bit here. Did any of you in the, I think it was last Sunday's Standard, did you read that little article by, um, is it Garvey, Sharon Garvey? Is the fellow that spoke at the North American on, we need to show God's grace, black brother, I don't know if you read that. He was sharing that in, in one of the colleges, he, had, he said something about the Holy Spirit and one of the uh, other students leaned over and said, uh, uh, you better be careful there. He said, we, we don't talk much about the Holy Spirit in the Christian church. I thought, well, that's what's wrong. And it, this, uh, and this is, uh, uh, Brenda can, uh, well, she wasn't there, but I told her about it, and, and it hit me wrong when he said this. We were sitting around talking about the Holy Spirit, and he plunked on the Bible, and I love the Bible. I mean, you, uh, most of you that know me know I love the Word of God, you know. He plunked on the Bible, and he says, this is all the Holy Spirit we're ever going to get. Well, no wonder the church is in such a bad uh, situation. Now, you, you remember we read there, they said the Holy Spirit doesn't speak of, its, of itself. That is, so it's like we're, we're not supposed to say Holy Spirit either. You know? He's not talking about that. He's talking about, it's not something that he originates in himself. He says what he sees and part of that reality that he sees is that it's his function, it's his ministry, it's his work to take this and give it to us. Let me, one, one more little thought. You know, Brother Fred, uh, one time after a long introduction of, that I have on my sermons, I tend to have, uh, he said to me, he said, you know, there used to be a big uh, steamship uh, paddle boat down on the Mississippi River. And uh, the guy that owned it really wanted to fix it up and really call attention to it. So he, he hooked up two huge steam whistles on this, you know. And they were ready to make the voyage on it. And the guy, the captain, blew the whistle. Ooh, no, everybody heard it and was all ready to go. The only problem is he used all the steam on the whistle and the boat wouldn't go. And so he always reminds me, be, be careful with the long introductions. I might blow all the steam and there's not enough for the rest. 
But we, one, one more point of introduction here, and that is th there are a couple examples in Luke 11, 42, um, um, amongst the woes to the Pharisee. One of the things, you can write this down, look it up. Uh, what, the woes to the Pharisees was you, you nickled and dimed it. You looked at all the meant and coming. He says, but you passed over the weightier matters. And one of the weightier matters was the love of God. And all this religiosity of their day and all the pomp and ceremony and attention calling things that was being done, he said, you overlooked the love of God. Or he also said uh, in John 5, 39, where he says, search the scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life, but you'll not come unto me. But he continues on, he says, but I know you that you do not have the love of God abiding in you. It is imperative that we have the love of God in us. Amen. Having said that, let's get to what I really want to say to you. And that is the, the, this revelation, this vision, this knowledge of the love of God is centered in a person. I think you know this, but let me remind it, it's in Jesus Christ. Probably all of us could quote uh, this scripture, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I, I like the, this, this word so, we tend to think of that as like, like a grandma or a grandpa saying, taking their grandson and saying, oh, I just love you so much, you know. That's, that's not the kind of so it is. It's a different so. It's the, we, probably we would better say thus, here's how God loves the world. God thus loved the world. How do you know anything about the love of God? You look at the cross of Christ. That's where it's at. That's where it's at. You look at what Christ did for us. In fact, I love this, that 1 John 3.16 says the same thing. Here is the love of God made manifest. You want to see it? God gave up his son. That is, he gave him up, not just... Remember, Jesus cried out from the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was when he gave up his son. Oh, I appreciated what Norma said about uh, the love, how looking at what Christ went through for us stirs up within us a response back to him. But, 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 but you didn't go far enough. Yes, he went through terrible tortures. It says that his, that his features, his, he was, uh, uh, his vestige, his, the way he looked was marred more than any other. This, this was a terrible, terrible physical thing that Jesus went through on the cross. But it paled. It paled to the wrath of the Father being poured upon the Son. Amen. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. God turned his back on the Son. That, that, you, know why that, you know why we have a hard time understanding that? It's too great for us. We can understand physical suffering. We can, and I'm not putting that down. This was terrible. But there was a greater suffering that demonstrated God's love for us. And the more we see of that, the more the love of God will indwell us and be part of us and have an effect upon us. Well, the text that from which this uh, God's love being shed abroad is Romans, the fifth chapter. Maybe let's just read a, a little bit of this. I particularly love this word shed. <laughs> I love that. Shed. The love of God is just poured out copiously. Listen to what it says here. Uh, Romans 5, beginning with verse 5. And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. Now, two thoughts came to my mind here in the shedding abroad. One was that... You look at the, the whole body of, of believers and, and, and God's love is shed abroad among every one of them. That's, that's what makes them believers. 
is understanding and seeing somewhat of the love of God in Christ Jesus. But I thought of it in another way, too, and that is, how about in every area of your own heart? Seth touched on that. All these different affairs of our life, all the different responsibilities that we have, if the love of God is shed abroad in every part of our life, of our heart, of our desires, what a difference that makes. That's what God has for us, shed abroad in our hearts. Through the Holy Spirit, which is given us, for when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died. You ought to put your name here. It says for the ungodly. I mean, just put your name there. He died for you. Do you understand that? Do, do you really... It, can you say, yes, I know that Christ died for you. There are people who can quote that. There are people who will nod their head and say that in, in various creeds. And they will say, our church believes that. Yes, I believe that. But the truth is, they never really thought about They never put their name. It's enough that Christ died for the world. But then he died for Ken Smith. Your name in there. If you can, you know why you can? The Holy Spirit has shed the blood. Amen. 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 That's why you can't do it apart from that. None of us by nature seek after God. There's none righteous, no, not one. No man can come to the Father, uh, Jesus said, except he be drawn. Bless God. This is what it's all about. But he says, he continues on here, for scarcely for a righteous man one will die, a peradventure. For a good man some would even dare to die, but, here's the disjunctive, but God commendeth his love. Oh, I love those terms. For God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners. What, what had you offered to God for this? Nothing. Nothing. You offered him nothing. You were, still, you were ungodly. You were yet in your sins. I like what, uh, speaking to Israel of old, he's, God says, uh, I didn't love you because you were the smallest of the nations or because you were the greatest of the nations. I set my love upon you. I love that. God chose to love when we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. Bless the Lord. That's what it's all about. Somebody quoted Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. This great love wherewith he loved us. Do you understand that? Do you see that? Can, can you in your heart and mind see that the, the, the stroke that was due us falling upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you see the love of God manifested in this? Do you see where he bore our sins? The stripes that were due us fell upon him. Do you see that? Do you see the heart of God being poured out on the cross of Christ? If you do, God is revealing that to you. The world laughs at this. Do you understand that? The world it makes it, oh, it's a bloody religion. Who wants that? But the very point of conflict with the world is the demonstration of the love of God. Bless God. He's done great things for us. Paul said to the Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 5. I, I love this. You think we could figure this out by ourselves. But anybody prays this, and I think it's a valid, I know it's a valid prayer. He says, the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. <laughs> you, you know why? Because we tend to look every place. We just bounce around. We look here and hope things would happen. And, and, and we need the Lord to set our faces, as it were, to the love of God. You know, remember what Paul said there in Hebrews? He says that we're to run the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus. Lord, direct our, our vision to the price that was paid for our redemption. And in your own heart, something will happen. 
Or how about this one, Titus 3. This is also quoted and probably will be quoted in, in uh, other uh, messages. But I want to look at this one because uh, I, I've quoted this verse, I don't know how many times, a number of times. I never saw it quite like this. I just, uh, thank you, Lord. Now, I, I may be wrong grammatically here, okay? I'm, just allow me this freedom. It's like uh, Norma said, uh, if you've got a complaint, talk to me in glory about it, okay? Well, that wasn't quite what she said, but uh, something like that. Uh, Titus uh, 3, verses 4 through 7. Now listen to what he says. But after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared. Now, here, here's what I'm going to do. Now, I don't know if I have the liberty to do this, but I'm going to. I'm going to put a parenthesis around something here, okay? I'm going to put it around the next verse. Not by... Uh, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the spirit. And take, now I'm, that's the end of parentheses. So now it would read, if we just take the parentheses out, it says, but after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior towards men appeared, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ. It's simply... What is that modifying? Is it modifying the Holy Spirit, which is also spoken of as having been poured out upon us, Pentecost, a number of times? But is it the love of God that's being poured out on those who have been redeemed, who have been renewed by the Spirit? Well, I think it may very well be the, the love of God. If not, it's taught other places in Scripture, so it's not that. But I love that. 1 John 3, the apostle says, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. Do you see that? Do you know how much God loves you? Can, can, can you, do you have a glimmer of that? Do you, do you begin to see this great love? The nth degree to which the Savior went. The nth degree to which the Father, in, in, in turning his back on the Son, pouring out. I love what the prophet said. He tread the winepress of God's wrath alone. Alone. Why? Because he loves you and me. Now that's the picture. That's the Holy Spirit stamps that love of God, allows you to see. It isn't, isn't that he just sneaks in. What he does, he, he opens the eyes. He, as as uh, Aaron pointed out, he, we, we've been made alive towards God. We're not dead. You know, do you ever try to preach to a dead person? Well, sometimes I feel like I do sometimes. But do you ever preach to you know, a person that's dead? Well, they don't respond very well. You know, well, and some saints don't respond very well. And you wonder if they're dead or at least maybe he's sleeping. But the truth is that we have been quickened, we've been made alive by the Spirit. And part of the Spirit's ministry then is to take these things of Christ and give them to us. Now, of course, we want it how soon? Right now. Isn't that right? We want it now, you know. After all, we're, we're mature people. I want, you know. But do you ever notice when a, when a baby is born, they're alive, aren't they? Oh, are they ever? At two and at six, they're alive. I mean, they're alive. They're very much alive. But they, they don't understand how much parents love them. In fact, they think parents are their slaves. You know, ah, okay, and they're supposed to be there. You know? <laughs> they don't understand the love. You know, and sometimes they get older, they don't understand it either. They'll, they'll say, Dad, can I do something? And you say, No. And they, well, you don't, you don't love me anymore, you know. When the truth of the matter is, you said no because you did love them. Takes a while. I think it was um, Mark Twain that said he was amazed how, said when he was 15 years old, his old man didn't know anything. And it was amazing how much he learned in those next uh, 10 years, you know. Well, that's the way it is with the saints of God. John said, I write unto you, babes, children, little ones. What did they know? Basically, they knew one thing. My sins are forgiven. <laughs> that's it. And that, that's, where you, that's, how you get, that's how you get in the kingdom. That's why you get in it, to get rid of the sins. It says, I write unto you, young men, because you are strong, 
Overcome the wicked one. I, I, I love working with spiritually, spiritual teenagers, spiritual young people. They get excited about the things of God. They're full of spizzerinktum. I almost, I'd like to hide them from the rest of the church, you know, because <laughs> they're, they're, I don't, want him to, I don't want him to get this attitude, well, that's somebody else. Do. One, of, one of the elders put a little sign, and you've probably seen this, a sign up, and, and it, it had about the four people in the congregation, nobody, everybody, somebody, and whatever the fourth one was, you know. And it's, everybody thought somebody else would do it, so nobody did it. You know, well, I, I would like to keep the saints, these live, exciting saints away from some of the older ones that have kind of settled in their ways and not God's ways. Let me just, uh, we're going to bring this to a close here. Let me, let me give you this picture. Having understand and, and seen somewhat of the love of God, what happens to you? What is one of the first things? The more you see of the love of God, what? The more you love God. Amen. Isn't that what John said? We love him because he first loved us. See, it, 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 you, you can almost examine how much of the love of God you really see by how much you love Him. Amen. If you don't have a love in your heart for Him, then it's probably simply because you don't see how much He's done for you. Amen. Over in the, the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, the third chapter, uh, right towards the, I think the fifth verse, towards the end there, it says, uh, we all, with open faces, behold, as in the glass, the glory that is like in a mirror, shadowed, reflected, but not the full glory, but we see a lot of it. We see, we behold the glory of the Lord. Now let me suggest, just take this one aspect of God's glory, and that is his love towards us. If you, with an open face, I know I've told you this, and you probably already know it anyhow. Open face means not looking, one, it's full face. It's like running to the, to the goal, looking right ahead, no, not looking to the right or the left. Open faced. And you look steadfast at the glory of the Lord. Let's look steadfast at the love of God towards us. What does that verse say it happens? It says, in that look, we are changed into that very same image Amen. from glory to glory. Amen. You want to be a loving person? Behold the love of God for you. You say, I can't see it. Then ask. Ask, Lord. We, we sing, open my eyes that I might... Do you really mean that when you sing that? Yes. Amen. You got to be praying that. One other aspect, and we'll close. Brenda always says I have about five endings. Uh, this one, this is a sum up verse. I found this, I, I added it uh, I, as I was just reading it. Oh, here, look at this. Over in 1 John, the fourth chapter. What have we been talking about? We've been talking about God's love being manifest to us. We're talking about our love for him. Just quickly, let me point out that when we, the more we see of God's love, it also does what to one another? It causes us to love one another. I mean, it says that. If, if, we, if, we, if he loves us, ought we not to love one another, the brethren? Hereby, we, we know that we have passed from death to life because we, why? Love the brethren. Why? Because that's, <laughs> his love is in us. Some of you are pretty unlovable by nature. I know I am, you know. Uh, and, and, but it, the Spirit of God allows us to, to love and teaches us to love. First John, the fourth chapter, Notice, uh, starting with verse 9. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us. Here's God's love. Because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God. You want to really, this is real love, is this. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Behold, if God so loved us, Okay, what's the, how's it going to work? We ought also to love one another. 
But then he goes ahead and says, no man can see the Father at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. Now listen, hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Isn't that beautiful? You see how it works? What beautiful harmony this is. That, that the, the spirit that is given to us teaches us to love. And when we see and, and, and experience that love, it, it's another way of saying, thank you, God. You're dwelling in me. Your spirit is resting in me. I want to do something tonight. I just want to challenge each one of you. I, I, I hope if I would ask for a show of hands, and I'm not, but if I would ask for a show of hands, I hope every one of you would say, I see, I know the love of God. But there may be some that don't. And you understand, you, you do not see the love of God outside of Jesus Christ. This is what uh, some of the religious, some of the quote Christian, I put quotes around it, religions, they talk about, but God just loves everybody. Yeah. And this is, the scripture doesn't. God loves everybody in this way that he gave his only begotten son. That's how he loves. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I am the way, Jesus said, the truth, the way it really is, and the life. That's it. The love of God is manifest not in some ishy-wishy feeling for the world, but it was manifested on the cross where Christ died in your place. Let me tell you, we, we don't, uh, to be opinionated anymore is not you know, uh, pit, uh, politically correct. You know, we need to, need to accept everybody. You know? well, God accepts everybody that accepts his son. Amen. That's his love, and that's our message. Now the question is, have you accepted the Son? That, that, that's something that we all must face. And, and, and some of us, as, as Norma pointed out, some of us could, we're, are good people. But good isn't good enough. Some of us are bad people. Bad isn't good enough either. Whosoever will, let him come and drink. We're going to sing a chorus tonight, and it's going to call chorus of invitation. If you've never accepted Jesus as Lord, and you can only do that by the Holy Spirit, by the way, if, if he's nudging on your heart, uh, uh, Norma talked today about being under conviction, that's, uh, and Al's going to preach about it, uh, but that's what's happening right now, the Spirit is at work. In fact, in Revelation, we, it, it's as though the, the, this, the body of believers right here are saying, come, and the Spirit is saying, come, and whosoever will, let him come and drink of the water of life. We're going to sing, uh, turn in your hymn books to number 513. Oh, how he loves you and me. Would you just stand together and sing that? And if you have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, we encourage you to come down and, and, and acknowledge this faith that you have in Christ, that you want to be part of his body, and you really want to, to open yourself up to, to the love of Christ. Would you sing this together, uh, both of these verses to the Lord?